Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I have spoken at George Washington University now three times. And when I was uh, trying to decide whether or not to make this run, I took a college tour uh, because I wanted to know if where my heart resides has some alignment with the young people of the United States. And um, it's really been a meaningful relationship with me. I have felt that, uh, you know, people who are Gen Z, people who are in college now, you're not even 20th century people. Uh, many of you weren't even born in the 20th century. Those of you who were just were there for a very short while as small children. And um, my sense has been that you don't see any reason why you should live your lives at the effect of bad economic ideas left over from the 20th century, and I agree with you. <clears throat> I feel very little here. I should have had a step, but that's all right. Well, I, uh, I know that you realize, as I do and as everybody on the planet does right now, we are living at a time of great tumult. And in order for us to both endure this moment, but even more importantly, to transform this moment, I think we need to ask deeper questions than just what do I do or what do we do? We have to ask ourselves, who do I have to be to even know what to do? Who do we have to be not only to know what to do, but to be capable of doing it? I was reading something, actually it was on the internet, about the poet Heinrich Heine. And he was talking about the construction of the great cathedrals in Europe. And one of the things that's always fascinated me about those cathedrals is that they took hundreds of years to build. He was specifically speaking about the cathedral in Cologne, which took 800, no, excuse me, 683 years to build. So that means you are working on something with all your heart, that you absolutely know you will never see finished, you will never see the final accomplishment. What does it take to make someone so devoted to a project that they're gonna, they're gonna do it whether or not they ever see the fruits of their labor? And Hanya Kaini said, those cathedrals were built by men who had conviction. He said modern men, and of course he was speaking in the 1800s, modern men, he said, only have opinions. And I thought how true that is of the times in which we live. Everybody has an opinion. These days, everybody has a brand. But where are our convictions and where are our principles? Because if we don't find them, we will not be able to easily endure this moment, and we will definitely not be able to transform it. Now, going back again to the idea of your being younger people, most of you in this audience, <clears throat> you were 21st century people. That means something. The 21st century mindset is different than the 20th century. And the 20th century mindset, of course, was different than the 19th. The 20th century mindset was very mechanistic. It was a Newtonian paradigm. The world is one big machine, and if we don't like what's happening, we need to tweak the pieces of the machine. And that is very definitely the core of our politics. It's like a machine. We're going to tweak it here. We're going to tweak it there. We're going to tweak the symptom here. We're going to tweak the symptom there. But I think we're all aware of that Einstein quote, that we will not solve the problems of the world from the level of thinking we were at when we created them. And yet, that's what's happening today. We are trying to solve 21st century problems with 20th century thinking. The 21st century mindset is far more holistic. It's far more whole person. A British physicist named James Jean said, well, it turns out the world is actually not one big machine. It's one big thought. And that's a physicist speaking. The idea that there's something whole person involved here. James Doty, a neurosurgeon at Stanford University Medical Center, who also started a center for compassion at Stanford with the Dalai Lama, he wrote an incredible book called Into the Magic Shop. <clears throat> and he talks in that book about how in neuroscience, they have discovered that there is far more of a relationship between the brain and the heart than they had previously thought. It had been accepted understanding that the brain is the intelligent center of the body. And now, Doty says, they have realized that there is a highway between the brain and the heart and that the two of them together are the intelligent center of the body. Now, the problems in our world today, and there are many, are a product of thinking disconnected from the heart. 
politics disconnected from the heart, economics disconnected from the heart, policy after policy after policy after policy disconnected from the heart. And the mind, when disconnected from the heart, is literally insane. And so if we try to only think our way out of what is happening now, in situation after situation, we are confronted with the fact that, as they say in AA, our best thinking got us here. And if our best thinking is only the thinking, that is the political thinking of what, 1995, which is the thinking that rules Washington today, then once again, we won't be able to endure and we definitely will not be able to transform. Now, as you saw in that video, I'm a, I'm a, just a real, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a scholar, but I certainly have studied a lot and love the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt and of course his wife, Franklin, his wife Eleanor. And there's a wonderful book by Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, that came out a few years ago called No Ordinary Time about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt during the Depression and during, the world, during world War II. And No Ordinary Time comes from a quote of Eleanor when she was speaking to an audience at that time and she said, this is no ordinary time. And I feel that you and I are living in an age that can also be described that way. This is no ordinary time. And yet we're a little bit like the frogs in the boiling water. We act as though it's a continuum and this is just more of the same. It is not more of the same. I remember reading a book many years ago about how nervous breakdowns work. And it was talking about a hysterical nervous breakdown and a catatonic nervous breakdown. And a hysterical nervous breakdown is when somebody spews it all, right? And a catatonic breakdown is when somebody just holds it all in. And this book was talking about the fact that sometimes it is the person closest to the person having the breakdown who doesn't recognize that we're in breakdown material. And they don't recognize that we're in breakdown material because basically it's the same way that that person has been, but just more so. And it takes someone standing on the outside saying, oh no, we've, we've moved into new ground here. And that's how America is today. We've moved into new ground. But the establishment, rather than recognizing this is new ground, and as Abraham Lincoln said, as our circumstances are new, we must think anew and act anew. Instead, the establishment actually tries to keep the lid on any conversation that addresses the fundamental changes that are occurring here, because in order to do that, they themselves would be, have to ask, or at least would be challenged, to actually change their own ways of being. And their own ways of being Although those ways of being and those ways of acting are what got us into this ditch, they would have us think that only they are qualified to drive us out of it. Well, this is no ordinary time. We are living in a moment of crisis, and yet there's good news and there's bad news. And if we realize how many times of crises have occurred in this country before, then we have a clue. We have a clue not only who to be, but what to do because we do have a history of rising to the challenge of various crises that have occurred in our past. Sometimes when you are living actually just about the age most of you are, you go to therapy, you do whatever it is you do to start to really undergo the process of individuation. You say, okay, where did my parents, who were my parents? What did my parents do? What about my grandparents? Where do I come from? Because you're trying to figure it all out. Where did they do it right? I want to take that. I want to stand on the shoulders of those, and I want to carry that forward. And where did they do it in a way I want to break the chain with that one, and I don't want to carry that forward in my life, and I don't want to bequeath that to my children. That's what we have to do as a generation. All of the psychological processes of growth and individuation and healing and repair that apply to us personally also apply to us as a nation because all that a nation is is a group of people. Now, it's interesting about Americans because you could take, you could take any two people. I could just say, okay, you over there, you over there, go have dinner tonight. And my experience, and I assume yours, leads me to believe that within an hour, you'd be having a real get-down conversation in a way that they wouldn't in every society. You would be asking real questions about yourself and you'd be about the other person and you'd be sharing about yourself from a pretty deep and real place. This is why when I travel internationally, I always love to sit next to an American. They'll get down, they'll get real. But when it comes to our collective conversations, our personal, our, our collective political conversations particularly, we have been trained to think like sixth graders. We have been trained to turn off all critical thought. 
We have turned to parrot whatever the narrative is that was handed down by the think tank of PR at our political party. And this is not the moment to give up critical thought. This is not a moment to let anyone else do your thinking for you. This is not a moment, it's definitely not a moment to farm out our thinking to a political class, which is what has happened in this country over the last few years. This is time for us to think for ourselves. This is time for us to take a very deep look at where we've been and where we are for ourselves and then move from there into a deeper consideration of who we need to be and what we need to do. In order to undertake that analysis, I want you to go back with me, please, to 1776, George Washington and others. Now, in 1776, <clears throat> 56 very brave men got together, and they, that's almost a casual way to put what they did, definitely they got together, and they signed a document, assigned a document that was world-shattering. And it was a document that was not only a profound political statement, it was a profound moral statement. It is a profound spiritual statement. And it would change the world. And it is a statement of greater social and political enlightenment that, that, than had ever infused the founding of a nation. And those 56 men, by signing their names, were very brave because... If the British had won the war, all of them would have been hanged, all of them would have been executed as traitors against the King of England. Start right there. Bravery and courage. And the main four principles, the four principles of the Declaration of Independence are America's mission statement. John Adams said he hoped that we would revisit them every July 4th. They're our North Star. That what Abraham Lincoln said was an eternal rebuke to forces of repression and tyranny. But what's happened? You know, in the Jewish religion, it says every generation must rediscover God for itself. And every generation of Americans has to take in these principles for ourselves. If all we do is, you know, they're, they're inscribed on marble walls somewhere or they're written in parchment and they're underneath glass at one of our great museums, that's not enough. You can't have, you, you can't break the chain. For those, for those principles to have vital life force, we have to take them in for ourselves. So let's look at the four basic principles, which obviously we all know. We all know, but how, have they really taken that journey without distance from the head to the heart in our age? Number one, all men are created equal. Number two, God gave all men inalienable rights of life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness. Number three, Governments are instituted to secure those rights, not thwart those rights, not diminish those rights, to secure those rights. And number four, if the government's not doing its job, it's the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Now that's where it all started, a profound burst of light inside the minds of people and the circumstances of humanity. But that's also where it got very gnarly, we know that too. Because out of the 56 of them, 41 were slave owners. That is the American story. We are both and. We have always been both and. It's a kind of bipolar, dichotomous consciousness, this America thing. We have been from the very founding, both people, whose hearts and minds were ablaze with the possibility that anyone should have the right to self-actualize. Anybody. Because when you say life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that is basically what we would call self-actualization today. And yet, from the very beginning, there were people who put property rights first, because that's what they saw, their slaves. People who, who feel, for their own ideological or financial purposes, <laughs> that they have no intention whatsoever of seeing those principles actually materialize, and have proven time and time again that they would do basically whatever it took to make sure that they did not. Now that's, that's the template. And that struggle is reiterated generation after generation. What is happening in our time is no different. It's the same struggle. But if you look at the trajectory of American history, we do, we're kind of impressed. Because we did respond to slavery with abolition. And we did respond to the institutionalized suppression of women with the women's suffragist movement. And we did respond to the Gilded Age with the establishment of organized labor. 
And we did respond to segregation with the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and so forth. I'm running for president because it is our turn now. <clears throat> it's not a particular institutional reality this time. This time, it's an economic paradigm. The institutional reality of slavery, got it, got to abolish it. The institutional suppression of women, got it, we got to pass the 19th Amendment. The institutionalized suppression represented by the Gilded Age, got it, we got to establish organized labor. The institutional suppression that is represented by the suppression of black people in the American South and segregation, got it, we need the Civil Rights Act, we need the Voting Rights Act. Now it's not one thing, it's an economic paradigm and it is a matrix of corporate power that represents nothing short of economic tyranny over the vast majority of the American people. It is a matrix made up of insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, big food companies, big agricultural companies, big chemical companies, gun manufacturers, big banks, big oil, and defense contractors. And at this point, the idea that they should increase their short-term profits is a principle which is now America's bottom line. Their soulless economic paradigm overrides democracy time and time again. It overrides humani humanitarian values time and time again. And I'll tell you what else it does. It ruins people's lives. We have one in four Americans who are living with medical debt. We have 18 million Americans in this country who cannot even afford to pay for the prescriptions that their doctors give to them. We have 68,000 people in the United States who die every year because they can't afford, they can't afford any health care. We have, we have um, 85 million Americans who are uninsured and uninsured, and there's only one reason for it. It's not that it's complicated, it is that it is corrupt. There is nothing that causes us to not have what they have in every other advanced democracy, as in universal health care, except for the institutionalized greed of the insurance companies. And we have 1.3 million Americans who ration their insulin, Ration their insulin. You know, we have people in this country putting GoFundMe pages up on the internet to pay for life-changing, life life-saving operations for themselves and their loved ones. You don't have that in any other advanced democracy. We've been just taught to limit our political imagination. We've been taught to expect so little. We need some good rambunctious, what the hell is this going on? All of that because of the institutionalized greed of the pharmaceutical companies. Not only that, your tax dollars subsidized to the tune of billions of dollars. These companies are already making billions of dollars so that then they can produce product which they will turn around and sell to the American people in price gouging, price gouging maneuvers. That is what is happening in this country. We have an $88 billion medical debt and we have an 80 billion, if you take the top five pharmaceutical companies, put together their profit last year alone is $80 billion. And the government, people in this town have marching rights and could get in there and should lower those costs and they don't because uh, any good corporatist, even in the Democratic Party, will go only so far to alleviate your pain, but only so far that it doesn't challenge those underlying corporate forces which ensure the inevitability that your suffering will be back because that would be challenging their donors and we mustn't have that. And that's why we have carcinogens in our food and that's why we have toxins in our water and that's why we have 46% of the, of the water wells in urban America are filled with PFAS, filled with, filled with these forever chemicals. That's why we are ramping up fossil fuel extraction at the time that we be ramp need to be ramping it down. That's why we have someone who actually calls himself the climate president because of the healthy investments, yes, in the Inflation Reduction Act, healthy investments over here in green energy and over there, hoping you won't notice, giving more oil drilling permits than even Trump did and okaying the Willow Project, the $8 billion ConocoPhillips oil extraction program up on the north slopes of Alaska and overseeing the $858 billion defense budget, which is an industry, which is, well, an establishment, several industries, which constitute the single largest herb, uh, uh, emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. Because when it comes to the defense and when it comes to big oil, they all fall in line no matter what party. Because that's what's happened. 
Washington has been held hostage. It has taken over at this point. It's little more than a system of legalized bribery. And that's baked into the cake. And no matter how much they tell you, oh, can't consider qualified anybody who's not one of us, their idea of qualified is somebody who is qualified because experienced in perpetuating and maintaining the system that I just described. I don't think that makes you qualified. I think what we need to do is not maintain and perpetuate that system. We need to disrupt that system. And that is why I'm here. <clears throat> I mentioned before about Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt said, a necessitous man is not a free man. You turn on television today and they talk to you about how good the economy is. Now, I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a philosopher. You don't use the word good around me like that. You're gonna use the word good. Let's talk about what good means. No country that has a permanent middle class has a good economy. We have, the large, we have the highest poverty rate of any advanced democracy. We have the highest child poverty rate, obviously, of any advanced democracy. We have one third of America's workers who live on less than $15 an hour and cannot afford a place to live. We have so many children in this country, millions of children, who go to school in schools that do not have the resources to teach them how to read by the age of eight. And if a child cannot learn to read by the age of eight or 10 at the most, their chances of high school graduation are drastically decreased and their chances of incarceration are drastically increased. That's why Roosevelt, Roosevelt talked about the four freedoms. We understand about the freedom of the press and the freedom of protest and the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech, but he also talked about the freedoms from, the freedom from want and the freedom from fear. We have 70% of Americans, 70% of Americans who claim to live with chronic economic anxiety. We have a majority of Americans who could not afford to absorb a $1,000 unexpected expenditure. And we call this good. We call it, the, in this town, too often it's called good. The economy's good. Yeah, unemployment's down. How many of those jobs are jobs that somebody could just live on working at one of them? And what is the minimum wage on all of those jobs? Because we were told, so many people, I don't know, maybe you remember they stood in line for about seven hours having been told to vote for this president because they were told that minimum wage would be raised. The minimum wage was raised to 15 for federal workers. But then when it came time to put that into the inflation, no, into the COVID relief bill, the president was stopped by the parliamentarian. Now, here's a little basic politics 101A for you. No Republican president would allow himself to be stopped by the parliamentarian. When the parliamentarian tried to stop George Bush, what did he do? He fired the parliamentarian. Hello. Hello. Oh, how I long for the day to see the left have a spine again in this country. <laughs> now, Franklin Roosevelt also said that we would never have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country, he said, as long as democracy delivered on its promises. You know, many Democrats, I among them, and I'm sure there are many people in this room who are very, very concerned because the fascists are at the door. That's just the fact. And many people have said to me, Mary Ann, how could you be running right now? Don't you understand? The fascists are at the door. And I want you to understand, that's why I'm running. I am running because if you think the Democrats are gonna win in 2024 by just going on and on about how bad Donald Trump is. Again, some politics 101A. Millions of people don't care. Millions of people are gonna vote for Donald Trump whether he's in prison. If you haven't convinced them by now, you're not going to convince them. The risk, the peril, and it is peril, it is electoral peril for the Democrats in 2024, is not people who are going to vote for Donald Trump. It is people who, if we don't offer more than the CHIPS Act and the infrastructure bill and Bidenomics that only affects 20% of Americans, then they will stay home. There are people who are not going to vote for the president if he, given the fact that he okayed the Willow Project. There are people who will not feel motivated to show up to vote in 2024 if they don't feel that there's really been something offered to them that is viscerally any different than was offered under Trump. 
you got to offer people more. You're not going to win in 2024 by just saying, oh, he's bad and talking about an economic situation that people really should be impressed by. And the smug elites say, well, they just don't understand. They should be happy with it. Really? They can't feed their children. They have no health care. You know, two doctors have said to me, these really impacted me, both of these stories. One of them is a doctor in Detroit. She said, you know, 15 years ago, if somebody came into my office and said, uh, and I told them, you know, the, the treatment that I prescribed for uh, their illness or their situation, the most common question I would hear was, what are the side effects? She said, the most common question I hear now is, what will it cost? Because the dirty little secret, the real underbelly of all this great insurance that people have is how many millions of people in this country, yes, their insurance will pay for them to go to the doctor, but their insurance will not pay for the tests. The insurance will not pay for the treatment. The insurance will not pay for the medicine. The insurance will not pay for the operation. One cardiologist in Texas told me, I don't even know why I bother to practice medicine. They come in, I know what's wrong, but they don't have the ability to actually have, them have the operation. This is not the case in any other advanced democracy. And people, people's lives are falling apart. People are spiraling down. And that's why I'm telling you, 2024 is not going to be a race like 2020. 24, 24 is going to be a race like 2016. And people in Washington, just like in 2016, are gonna to be totally amazed because they had no idea that the rabble was that close to the gates of the Bastille. But I'm telling you, the rabble is. And when you go back to that issue of the nervous breakdown, the nervous breakdown that's either catatonic or hysterical, a lot of people, you know, if it's a rage that's outward, we've seen what the rage outward looks like when it's expressed outward. When rage inward is, is reflected in depression, it is reflected in anxiety, it is reflected in a kind of self-medicating numbness, it is reflected in addiction. Then we ask, where does the mental health crisis come from? As though systemic economic injustice had nothing to do with it? And everybody who has said to me, Marianne, how can you run? Don't you understand the fascists are at the door? This is a conversation that follows every single time. Let me guess, you have health care, don't you? Let me make another guess. You actually could afford to send your kids to college, couldn't you? Let me guess again, you, you probably make more than $15 an hour, and you can afford to live on just that one job. You almost have the, the, the privilege of indulging yourself in thinking that the only problem we have is fascism. Donald Trump is not a cause, he is a symptom, the cause of which is institutionalized corporate greed. Because institutionalized corporate greed has become a petri dish, that petri dish made up of large groups of desperate people. And large groups of desperate people should be considered a national security risk. And if the world can't see that now, I don't know what to tell you. Large groups of desperate, desperate people become a petri dish out of which all manner of personal and collective dysfunction is inevitable. One of which is vulnerability to ideological capture by genuinely psychotic forces. Do we need any more proof of that now? That we can just, you know, and I love Washington DC. I've actually lived here now for over two years. Met some wonderful, wonderful people here. There are wonderful people everywhere. Nothing that I'm talking about tonight has to do with nice people versus not nice people. And we must not personalize it. And not every rich person is a greedy bastard. Not every poor person is wholly impure. That's not what this is about. We're talking about systems now. But I will tell you, as someone who had not lived in Washington before, I will tell you this. I had always been told it was a bubble. You know, they always say Washington is a bubble. It's not just a bubble. It's a walled city. There are too many people here. And that wall becomes like an emotional buffer that separates people from the realization of how much suffering is going on out there. One woman told me a story. I'm not going to tell you which president it was because it doesn't really matter. She was in the Oval Office. She had worked on his campaign. She was all excited. She got offered a job in the administration. And she was at a very high level meeting one day in the Oval Office. And they were talking about certain economic policies. And one of the president's top aides said, well, you know, we don't have to worry about that. I mean, what would really would that one do? It would, you know, it would save people, what, maybe $300 a month. And she said, I got up and I quit. 
Because if there are people in the Oval Office who can be so casual that they don't really recognize what $300 a month would do for millions and millions and millions of people, I don't know what to tell you. And this is what I mean. This is time for us to get real. It's not enough to just get real when we're talking among ourselves about personal issues. And another thing we know when we talk about personal issues, all of us, for unfortunate reasons, have become very sophisticated about drugs and alcohol. And we know that if somebody's using too much, drinking too much, most of us have actually been in situations where we look and think, hmm, too much. And have either received a call from a friend or made a call to a friend in which these words were spoken. Do you think we ought to do something? And that's what people say when we know, you know, she could kill somebody. She could, she could drive her kids. She, she could be in the car with her kids. I mean, all kinds of things we know. We know that people overdose. We know that people die of alcoholism. And so we understand it's in the parlance. It's in the mainstream parlance. Maybe we better intervene. But when it comes to our democracy, when it comes to our democracy, we are in magical thinking. Like what? It couldn't end? It could end just like your physical life could end if you abuse your body too much? Your democracy could end if you abuse it too much. It is time. And the Declaration of Independence says we have the right. It is time for the people to intervene. And that means... <clears throat> And that means that we have to have the convictions that Heinrich Kaini was talking about. We have to have some bravery. We have to have some courage. And we have to have some willingness to be realistic about what's happening in this moment. I've heard some powerful progressives, you know, they tweet good. And they've been saying that we're going to come back at it in 2028. Oh, really? We're going to come back in 2028, are we? As though we should really assume that that's even going to necessarily be possible if a certain somebody gets back into the White House. So when Franklin Roosevelt said, we don't have to worry about a fascist takeover as long as democracy delivers on its blessings, my suggestion is that we will win in 2024 by presenting the American people with an actual alternative. That is why I've taken the uh, FDR's Economic Bill of Rights transformed it for the 21st century with a lot of the ideas that he had. The American people should have universal health care. The American people should have tuition-free college and tech school. The American people should have a complete cancellation of those college loan debts. The American people should have subsidized child care. The American people should have paid family leave. The American people should have guaranteed housing. The American people should have guaranteed sick pay. And the American people should have a guaranteed living wage. And I want to point out to you that everything I just said is considered a moderate position in every other advanced democracy. It's only in America today that, ooh, that's so fringe. Ooh, that's so left. Ooh, that's unserious. Oh, let me tell you some other people who call me unserious. They don't say it because they really think I'm unserious. They say it because they know how serious I am. You and I. <clears throat> you and I are the ones having the serious conversation. And I invite you to look at my issues page on my, at Marianne 2024. We have to have a very serious um, uh, conversation about the unsustainable amounts of tension and anxiety that exist in America today. This is why I also want a Department of Peace and I want a Department of Children and Youth and I want to end the war on drugs in this country. <clears throat> this was this was such a tra another tragedy brought to you by the Washington establishment. In 1971, Richard Nixon established the war on drugs. And most of you don't remember this, but some of us in this room do. One of the Nixon aides that went to prison over the Watergate scandal was a man named John Ehrlichman. And he, it was, he went to an interesting transformation in prison. Man, he got out. And he'd been this really clear-cut, you know, crew-cut guy, and he looked like something out of the 1950s, and he got out, and he long hair and a beard, and moved to New Mexico, and then he spilled the beans. And one of the things that he spilled the beans about was the so-called war on drugs. He said Nixon knew it wasn't war, the public enemy number one, which is what he said. And he said it was basically an attack on black neighborhoods. And since 1971, we had spent over a trillion dollars on the war on drugs. 
When I was in college, there were 300,000 people incarcerated in the United States. Today, there are 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States, and almost half of our federal prisoners are nonviolent drug offenders. This has been a real boom for the prison industrial complex. And even today, we spend over $100 billion a year on the war on drugs. And for a fraction of that, we could have a world-class system of recovery options. I don't want a drug czar. I want a recovery czar when I'm in the White House. I want a recovery czar because we need to move. <clears throat> We need to move. We need to move from treating drug addiction as a criminal issue to treating it as a health issue, such as they do in places like, uh, in places like Portugal. There are so many ways. It doesn't just have to do with recovery. It has to do with agriculture. It has to do with rehabilitating people after they get out of prison. It has to do with a more rehabilitative uh, process within the prison system. It has to do with police reform. It has to do with education. It has to do with children. It has to do with every single possibility. It has to do with peace building. We have the people in this country. We have the geniuses. We do. We have the projects, and we have the best practices. None of that. None of that is missing in this country. The problem in this country is the people with solutions over here and the people with the power over there. The people with solutions don't have the power, and the people with the power too often don't really want to hear from the people with solutions because those solutions don't actually provide short-term profits for their corporate donors. All that they provide is, I don't know, maybe saving our democracy and possibly saving our planet. This is not going to change. The status quo will not disrupt itself. Only we can do that. And so this is a time for us to think very deeply and to think very deeply for ourselves and not to just buy the stale lines that are just fed to us by, by people who are more interested in power, people more interested in a a framing of situations that, whether they know it or not, and even if and when, and this is often the case, they might have the best of intentions. They don't get the 21st century. They don't get what's happening out there. They just don't get it. You know, in 2016, in 2016, I, I remember where I was the night that the election was, uh, results were announced, and I was with a group of very, very horrified people. And uh, I certainly shared their horror, but what I did not share was their shock. Because I have been traveling in my career for decades. I have been up close and personal with people whose lives were in trouble. And at the beginning of my career as an AIDS activist, and so many things that I was involved with, really, people who had just gotten the call and the test results came back, bad news, it's cancer, just got the call, their child is addicted to heroin. I'd been up close and personal with people whose lives were in trouble. But what happened for me around the year 2000, the end of the 1990s, was I met more and more people, particularly when I moved to Detroit, Michigan, who were really good people, who were really trying to live their best lives and raise their children well and do everything right. But they were so held down. They were so shackled by just bad public policy, the results of bad public policy. And of course, it wasn't hard to understand. This was the flowering of the Reagan revolution, the flowering of trickle-down economics, the $50 trillion transfer of wealth away from 90% of Americans, just squeezing the money. And of course, the great canard of that time was move all the money, move all the money into the hands of the stockholders at the expense of other stakeholders, at the expense of the workers, at the expense of unions, at the expense of the community, at the expense of the environment. But that will be good, see, because all those people who make all that money will be job creators, and then all that money will trickle down. Well, after, almost, uh, after over 40 years, the jury is in. The money did not trickle down. It left millions of people without even a life vest. And that is because their, jo their job, their model was never, their business model was never job creation. Their business model was job elimination. Their business model was the exploitation of the American worker. And that is why in the 1970s, the average American worker had decent benefits, and the average American worker could afford a car, and the average American worker could afford a house, and the average American worker could afford a vacation, and the average American couple, should they choose, one parent could stay home with the kids, and they could live the whole family of four at least on that one salary, and why they could, they could afford to send their kids to college.
We had tuition-free college and tech school in this country until the 1970s. They had it at University of Florida, they had it at University of Texas, and they had it at University of California. So I'm old enough to remember when it was very, very different. And what I'm concerned about sometimes talking to young people is that so much of this injustice, so much of this economic injustice, so much of this predatory vulture form of malevolent capitalism has been so normalized that you guys might not even remember that it was at one time not this way in this country. But I think that the role of the older person is to be the keeper of the stories. And so I wanna tell you those stories, but I wanna do more than tell you those stories. I want to take the levers of power and do something about it. And for those of you who are young, this is what I submit to you. I don't even want you to have to worry about health care. And I don't even want you to have to worry about tuition. I don't want you to have to worry about college loans. I don't want you to have to worry about the future of your, uh, of your democracy because you really see that the government's on it. They're trying. And I want you to feel the same way about the environment. But there's a quid pro quo there. Because obviously, I don't think your government should invest in you so that you can kind of slack. But I don't think that's what you want to do. I want you to have those things so that you can then go be an incredible human being. So that you can fly, so that you can soar, so that you'll be an amazing scientist, an amazing artist, an amazing healer, an amazing business person, amazing whatever you want to be. An amazing friend, an amazing lover, an amazing partner, an amazing spouse, an amazing parent, an amazing citizen. Because this country will not be repaired unless and until we repair. We have to re have a season of repair. This country is headed towards the iceberg, everyone. And one major political party, with its policies, we're headed right there. The other major political party, with the corporatist element of that establishment within that party, is moving there more slowly and would hit it at a different angle. I say we have to turn this ship around. You put me in the White House, and I won't be able to get it all the way around in four years, but I think I can get us around the curve and then hand it over. Because in 2028, a baby boomer should not be president. But during that four years, <clears throat> I'll have other things to do. I want to do a few things before I die. <laughs> but I hope that my presidency, if you choose to give me that power, will be a time when you can incubate within yourself some new layers, some new dimensions of what you think of as a meaningful life. And I hope that what you will think of as a meaningful life is not just your rights, but also your responsibilities and your ownership of power, not only with which you can have the life that you want, but so that you can be contributors to what the American dream is. The American dream is not just that you can have what you want or you can have what you want. The American dream is that anybody should have a shot. There's nothing wrong with making money. Making money is good. The problem with America today is not enough people ever have a chance to. And I have one last thing to say about that to you kids at George Washington. The system loves you. It has to pick out the most talented and the brightest in every generation, you know, to run itself. And then the game is that as you become successful, if you start saying, yeah, but I, I think there's some people here who, who are in trouble, then the system will turn to you and say, well, what are you complaining about? It works for you, doesn't it? Don't buy the bullshit. Individuate from that. Know that something's going wrong here. And I know that the that the challenges are really, really rough. But I think that the abolitionists had some tough days, desperate days, they held together. The women suffragists had some tough days, some desperate times, they held together. The early labor organizers had tough days, rough times, but they held together. And the civil rights movement was filled with people who had tough, desperate times, but they held together. But they didn't just protect their brands, and they didn't just express their opinions, and they didn't just tweet. We need a revolution at the ballot box, and the revolution we need, you can't have over white wine and brie. We've got to rise up. We've got to all be very mature, and we've all got to also be very courageous. If we do, we will do what our ancestors did. We will rise to the challenges of our time. We will course correct this country. Now, there's something that most of you in this room can't sort of imagine yet, which is what you're going to think about on the last day of your life, but I can say to you, I will die if we do this, feeling like I kind of kicked ass before I left, and you will get to live decades. No, you're kicking ass as you move along. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very kind of you. Thank you. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to leave or do you want to do some Q&A? Q&A. And what... <laughs> Old mama here has hearing aids. What did you just say? <laughs> Q&A? Okay. All right. So uh, we have somebody. You want to turn some lights up, uh, Lauren, for this part? And uh, Vincent has some uh, mic. Okay. Just raise your hand, and uh, I'm going to come down because I need to sort of see you. Okay. You're over here. Okay, great. Go on. Are there stairs on that side? Hold on one second. I'll be with you in one second. I have to go around here. No, no, they're here. They're, 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 they're oh, wait, I'm in the front. Okay, I'm coming. Thank you, Marian, for being here. Thank my, you. My question for you is, in which way do you believe that the Course in Miracles ties in with your presidential priorities? Well, I don't think it has anything to do in terms of, you know, it's a spirit. It, well, actually, you know, it's not a religion. It's a psychological mind training. It's about psycho psychology and spirituality. I'm a Jew, that's my religion. And A Course in Miracles is a book, it's not a religion, it's read by many people from all religions and no religions. And it's a book about being more loving, about being more forgiving, about what it means to really stand on the possibility of infinite possibility. So it's very meaningful for me. I tell you, try running for president and not meditating in the morning <laughs> and see how it works for you. That's, uh, there's nothing in the Course in Miracles that anyone who has read it would say is anything other than a book about how to be more loving and more forgiving and how to apply that in practical ways. And by the way, you know, memo to people, Americans are a religious country. And the fact that so much of the left particularly, and I want to say something about that too, when you look at the great trajectory of social justice movements in this country, they emerged from religious and spiritual sources. Among white Americans, the abolitionist movement emerged from the early evangelical churches in New Hampshire. The women's suffragist movement was led by a majority of, of those women were religious Quakers. And Dr. King, hello, was a Baptist preacher. Dr. King said that the desegregation of the American South, he said, is the political externalization of the goal of the civil rights movement. He said the ultimate goal is the establishment of the beloved community. And King said that in order to achieve this, we must have external shifts in our circumstances and internal shifts in our souls. And that's what I've been talking to you about tonight. Look at the two greatest revolutionary changes in the 20th century, the Indian independence movement and the American civil rights movement. And both of them were led by men who based their philosophy on the principle of nonviolence. And the principle of nonviolence as articulated by Gandhi, and then King went over to India, he studied those principles and he brought them over to the United States for their application to the civil rights movement in the 1960s. The whole idea, as, as Dr. King said, Gandhi was the first person to take the ethic of love and lift it, take it beyond personal interaction and turn it into a broad scale social force for good. And Gandhi had gotten, he said he got a lot from Thoreau, from the Transcendentalists, from Emerson, from Whitman, and the idea of the spirit within us all. When I was growing up, you know, JFK said we cannot afford to be materially rich and spiritually poor. Bobby Kennedy Sr. was the one who said that this was a struggle for the soul of America. You know, when I was growing up, when I was the age of most of the people in this room, we read, you know, Alan Watts and Ram Dass in the morning, and we went to Vietnam anti-war protests in the afternoon. There wasn't this split that, oh, if you're interested in the inner life, then you don't have anything to do with politics, or that if you have something to do with politics, you eschew any aspects of the inner life. Everything that I was talking about at the beginning tonight had to do with the idea that in the 21st century, we have to realize there is an inner life, just as there is an outer life. And that's what I was saying. You know, when you said, what does the Course in Miracles have to do? I'll tell you what it has to do. The Course in Miracles, like 
you know, it's based on universal spiritual themes. So this is true in Judaism, in Hinduism, in, in Islam, in Christianity. These principles are the same everywhere. But these principles of personal transformation, if anything, I realize, and I think this is a large part of what leads me to do what I feel like doing, which is being here, is that the same principles of personal transformation, which heal one person's life, heal a country's life, because a country is just a group of people. For instance, if you've got, you're not gonna have the future you want if you don't clean up the past. That's why I support reparations. Such as, you have to look in the mirror here, hello, whether you're an individual seeking to repair or a country. Can we look in, or look in the mirror here? Are you who you say you are? Are you standing on the principles that you say you believe in? Are you who you purport to be? And are you willing to change? Are you willing to atone for your mistakes? Are you willing to make amends to those you have wronged? Everything I talk about in this presidential campaign, I learned from the career I've had for 40 years. And more than that, not just from, from learning those principles, but trying my best to apply them in my life and seeing them as they apply really to thousands, if not millions, of other people's lives. This country's got to get real. This country's got to look in the mirror with compassion with wisdom and with responsibility, and I think I'd be very good at trying to lead that process. <clears throat> yes. Hi. Um, so the Democratic Party and Joe Biden like said that like that he wouldn't debate you and stuff. I'm like sorry, that. Joe Biden. What? Joe Biden said that he wouldn't debate you. Yeah, Joe Biden said he wouldn't debate me. Um, I don't know why. Yeah, like. <laughs> I guess what would your response to that be? And like I too, like you, I'm very concerned about how the 2024 election is going to go yeah. and stuff like that. What would be your response to Joe Biden in that? All right. First of all, nothing personal here. Joe Biden is a lovely man, and he deserves a lot of credit for beating uh, um, for beating uh, Donald Trump in 2020. So I want to make that very clear. We need to keep all this very high-minded. Okay. There's this narrative you know, promulgated by the DNC, that if you have a sitting president, if you have an incumbent president, then you, you don't debate them, uh, you don't uh, challenge them. Now, I grew up in a generation where, huh? <laughs> Eugene McCarthy challenged uh, Lyndon Johnson, Bobby Kennedy Sr. challenged Lyndon Johnson. Nobody said, oh, how dare he? So they said, oh, no, 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 no. Teddy Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy. He challenged Jimmy Carter and Jimmy Carter lost. Memo, Ronald Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter. Ronald Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter. I was there. I don't think Teddy Kennedy defeated Jimmy Carter. Also, there's this other thing. It's called the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution says that in order, it, does, it says we have elections every four years. That's all it says. And it doesn't say anything about political parties. As a matter of fact, George Washington warned us about them. George Washington, in his farewell address, said he was concerned that political parties would, be, would form factions of men, he said, more loyal to their party than to their country. And John Adams said he feared they were the biggest threat to our democracy. What is this? Who, who, who are they? They're a private corporation. They admit that they're a private corporation, and they admitted in court, and unfortunately they won in court when challenged by some ex-Bernie supporters in 2016 when they tried to sue the DNC for their suppression of Bernie's candidacy. Their argument in court was, well, we're a private corporation, so we don't really owe people a democratic election. And they won. So I believe that candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. <clears throat> last time, last time I had a CNN town hall, last time I was on CNN regularly, last time I was on MSNBC regularly, but I'm afraid to tell you, in case you possibly don't know, CNN and MSNBC are to the Democratic Party what Fox is to the Republicans. It's a political media industrial complex, and this is the issue. I used to think, well, these people just chop wood and carry water for huge corporate interests. But now what I've realized in this campaign, no, they are a huge corporate interest. So this is what I mean by everybody think for yourselves. Think for yourselves. And I've seen things, you wouldn't like it if you knew some of the stuff that goes on. Uh, goes on. You, you wouldn't like it. 
Just trust me, you wouldn't like it. Yeah. So I have more of like a serious topic that I want to get your opinion on. We all grew up in a generation that was pretty much defined by gun violence and school shootings. So what is your plan to make sure that my 10-year-old little brother doesn't have to worry about being shot and killed in his class? On this one, I will give credit to the Democratic presidents in this century. They have tried. Um, the hold, obviously, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. The hold of the NRA, uh, the lobbying arm of, of uh, gun manufacturers, is so extreme. A lot of this is math. But let me tell you this. One of the things I think I mentioned earlier, a majority of Republicans as well as Democrats want universal health care. A majority of Republicans, as well as Democrats, want tuition-free college, which is, once again, why they don't want me out there. But also, a majority of Republicans, as well as Democrats, including gun owners, want universal red flag laws, want more common sense gun legislation. You know, recently, because of shootings in Tennessee and Kentucky, you now have some red governors in a way that would not have happened 10 years ago, who are open who are open, whether it has to do with high capacity magazines, whether it has to do with boyfriend loopholes, all of those things. There, this is a moment where for tragic reasons, obviously, there, there's, there's, a, there's a moment here. But what you're gonna have to do, you know, let me tell you something. I'm not somebody saying, send me to Washington. We're in Washington, but you know what I mean. Because I'm gonna fight for you. Then I don't want to do that with the next four, four years of my life. I want to go and be here in that big house down the street to co-create with you. Because the same issues that I'm going to have to deal with in Washington, if you elect me, people are going to have to deal with in state houses all over. So a lot of this has to do with state laws. And what's going to have to happen, and this is what I mean again about a quality of our own personhood, we are going to have to make politics. If we're going to endure and transform these times, we, we can't just farm this out. We can't just say, oh, well, I vote every two years, every four or four years, so that's enough. Not when corporate lobbyists are in those people's offices every single hour of every single day. So my point there is, you're not going to have to just elect someone like myself, or really, I'm pretty much any Democratic president is on it about this one. You're going to have to elect different Congress people, and you're going to have to elect different senators. So we're going to have to all rise up. And that's a math issue. We had a 10-year assault weapon ban, and during that time, during that time, uh, there was a radical decrease in the number of, of uh, mass shootings. And when you were just mentioning your little brother, you think we have a mental health crisis now? In 10 years, we are going to have a generation coming of age who, when they were in elementary school, prayed every morning that they wouldn't get shot. <sighs> I would try my best, but all of us have to be involved in that one. <clears throat> you go on and wherever you think, yes. Hi, Marianne. Hello. You are such a great candidate. Thank that you. you are going to win the election. Oh, thank you. Even if you, if you run as an independent, okay? My mother would hear, were here, she would say, from your yeah. mouth to God's ears. Yeah. <laughs> the people who are running against you, like Biden, with his age, and uh, uh, Trump with his crimes, uh, should, should, should not even be close to presidency. So, and uh, by the way, I run a, a website, uh, Facebook page called Marianne Williamson for President. Oh, thank you. And I also have a media website, mediamorez.com, that is the most progressive website. Excellent. So uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. And my prayers are with you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, speaking of the Democratic Party machine, I have a small personal anecdote, which is the only person I ever um, p did political phone banking for was a member of Justice Democrats because I'm against taking corporate PAC money. And I got this really unfortunate phone call from someone who said, I hate Justice Democrats. And I asked them why. And they said, because they never do what they say they're going to do. 
And so my question to you is that we've seen Congresswomen occupy the politician activist paradox, and we've seen the DSA style insurgency, and then we've seen them bend the knee when it comes to force the vote. If you get the presidency, who do you think that you can lean on, and who would you pass the baton to in 2028? Well, who I would be passing the baton to is up to you. I mean, that's not up to me any more than it's up to you. Um, I think for the very reasons that you say, in order to create the kind of fundamental shifts and fundamental economic reforms that we're talking about, it does need to be somebody from outside that system. When you're talking about force the vote, Oh, remember you could just see Nancy Pelosi walking down the steps with Ilan Omar, remember? And I went, oh, it's so all over. <laughs> you, could almost, you could almost hear her. You could just imagine the conversation. Honey, I was you once. I was you once. We want the same things. Here's my cell phone number. And I'm sure Hakeem has given his phone number to a few. He got my, I mean, I cannot believe how easily people are seduced in this town. I, I, I sometimes can't even believe it. Here's my number. Any, we're going to do this together. Just stay with me. How long before we go, you know, it's so odd, it's never happened. <laughs> it's never happened. And about a lot of those people, with all due respect, why do I have to be here? Where are they? Why am I the one up here? You might ask yourself, because they're, 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 they're in obeisance to the establishment. And then I love this one. Everybody's saying, well, maybe in a couple of weeks or three weeks, one of them will come in. So wait a minute, let me think this through. Somebody who didn't have the courage to stand up to the DNC, we're supposed to think they have the courage to take on the insurance companies. They have the courage to take on the pharmaceutical companies. They have the courage to take on big oil. They, what can they do to me? Take away my seat on the appropriations committee? Primary me next time? They, they can't kind of do anything. I mean, listen, I'm not naive. What I go through now, it's not fun. I wake up every morning to online bullying. I wake up every morning to insults and lies and smears. I get it. And I imagine that being president is even more so. But we've got to break through. We've got to, we've got to do something. So I would hope that a lot of those people, you know, the ones who treat, tweet well but aren't here, I would hope that maybe, I don't know, maybe they'd feel a little liberated by having a president who agrees with them. But I'll tell you something, it's not even just them that I'm thinking of in terms of my allies. I'll tell you who I think of as my allies. Remember when I talked a few minutes ago about all these people in this country who know what to do? They know how to repair the earth. They know how to do uh, uh, organic uh, gar uh, uh, agriculture. They know how to rehabilitate people's lives. They just have no power but they have solutions. When I have a visual of my presidency, this is what it looks like. Are you ready? I open up all the doors and all the windows in the Oval Office and I go, come on in guys, we got it for four years. <laughs> Let them in, bring them in, bring them in. And then, and listen, the president does not have a magic wand. No president has a magic wand. And we don't want our president to have a magic wand. You know, that's not what this is about. There are three co-equal branches of government. And clearly there are times there have been Republican presidents, and certainly in my lifetime, who have abused the power of the presidency. But there have been Democratic presidents who get so milk toast and won't even use the full power of the presidency. We do have marching rights, for instance, to lower pharmaceutical drugs and so forth. I would use the power that was given to me. I would not abuse it, but I would use it. And that would be part of the value of the fact that I'm not running again. Because I'm not even thinking about, ooh, they won't reelect you if you do that. And then I turn it over to you. Or to a younger generation, and you decide who. Does that make sense? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you. I want to end uh, with one little thing here. At the beginning of this evening, I talked about how we have to change on the inside. Uh, once again, Martin Luther King, external changes, but also internal shifts. And one of the issues that we must assume, one of the layers of consciousness we must assume is conviction. Conviction is a force multiplier. And you'll remember what I said earlier in the evening about Heinrich Heine, who said that the men who built the great cathedrals had convictions and not just opinions. 
there are people who hate in this country, but there are far more people who love. The problem is those who hate tend to have more conviction than is displayed currently by those who love. And if you have 10 people who hate, but they show profound conviction behind their hate, and then you have 90 people who love, but they're just available to show it on maybe, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, then hate will win and it will overwhelm us. So I hope that some of what we talked about tonight uh, made you think not only in terms of the external issues that we're also concerned about. And I, I really, um, I thank you. I thank you for the depth of your listening. I thank you for the sophistication of your questions. I thank you for participating in this. Ideas grow stronger when they're shared. But I also hope that you will take from this evening um, some deeper questioning about changes within yourself that are going to be necessary, um, that are going to be necessary among all of us. Uh, dedication to justice, how much do we really mean that? Dedication to liberty, how much do we really mean that? Uh, dedication to our responsibilities, how seriously do we take them? I wish you all the very best in your lives. I hope that uh, all the things that you want to have happen will, uh, will happen. I hope that you will soar. I hope that you will, whatever you're dreaming for yourself, uh, I hope that those dreams will come true. And I hope that together we will weave a profound and beautiful dream for our country and for our world. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored that you were here. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>